Namaste, it's Sahara Rose, and welcome back to the Highest Self Podcast, a place where you discuss what makes you your soul's highest involvement. If it's your first time listening, this episode is going to be very different than my other ones because it's just a deep dive conversation with one of my best friends about just everything happening in the world. We're going through a time of a lot of chaos, whether you're on a spiritual journey or not, we are all feeling it. And this year has really been unlike any other with the series of events that our souls in some way chose to experience, though challenging and confronting and often painful. And this year ain't over and it can feel like things are just getting more chaotic. So in this episode, I wanted to discuss just friend to friend the types of conversations that I'm having, you know, with my with my community about navigating what information and documentaries and all of these things that we are seeing in the world and how to find balance amidst all of this, you know, craziness. And I think it's fine to admit that we all feel overwhelmed. I myself do as well and I think that's why it's more important than ever that we can speak about whatever it is that we're feeling. In my last solo cast, I spoke about, well, two solo casts ago, I spoke about why it's so important to actually speak about the fears and the uncertainties that you're experiencing rather than just bypass over them because it's only through going into those fears that we're able to see whether there is a potential or unmet need underneath it and bring about healing. So, Though it may seem easier to kind of pretend that the world around us isn't happening, the truth is it is. And the only way we're going to find peace through it is to have these conversations and feel like we've been able to explore, you know, different concerns that we may have, different different belief systems that we may have, you know, been been shown or told and find our own way through it. So this is a conversation. It's not here to really tell you what to think. It's just us looking at, for example, the social dilemma being a big documentary that came out about social media and the algorithm and how a lot of these social media companies are kind of selling our information to other people or, you know, big brands to share ads with us. And also what's on the other side of that, you know, going back to just having six channels on mainstream media and all of the different theories that we hear and how sometimes going into some of the theories can actually bring us to an even more fear-based state. But the other side of that is to not question the world that we're told we live in. So nothing is one-sided. Everything has dualistic views. And that's what I shared in my last solo cast as well, that things just aren't so black and white. So this conversation is really an exploration about the different viewpoints and conversations that people are having right now. And then despite it all, how to find balance, how to find sovereignty and how to find peace. So we explore all the things. And at the end of the episode, Rosie shares with us her yoga nidra practice, a quiz that she's creating to help you find the right yoga nidra practice for your sleep archetype. And just to allow yourself, I hope with this episode to go down those hesitations, those fears, those concerns that you have, but then also come back to your breath, come back to your body, because at the end of the day, we're never going to figure it all out. And we have these conversations to explore these different avenues, but it's not to find the answer underneath it all, because the truth is it's still unveiling. We don't know where where all of this is going to take us, but we can trust that if we continue to have the difficult conversations and align with our truth and have them with compassion and love and anchor into our own soul's frequency before giving up our sovereignty to the world around us, then we can trust that we'll always navigate this path in our highest alignment. So sit back and enjoy. This is a very authentic and real conversation, completely unscripted. And we definitely 
talk about things that most people I think are a little bit afraid to explore, especially on a public platform like a podcast. And, you know, I decided to put this out there because I know that so many people listening to this podcast don't have friends that they get to have these conversations with and feel really alone going through these experiences. So, you know, I don't know if y'all want to cancel me for even just questioning the news. I don't, nothing I can do about that, but I'd rather put myself out there and help other people who are going through these uncertainties and let them know that it's okay to not have the answer. It's okay to feel overwhelmed and it's okay to just want to go back to your yoga mat sometimes. And sometimes that's really what we need. So without further ado, let's welcome one of my best friends, yoga teacher, yoga nidra expert, tantrika, and such an incredible queen, Rosie Acosta to the Highest Self podcast. And before we get started, I have an announcement for you. Are you yearning to connect deeper with your sacred womb wisdom? Are you calling in more divine feminine essence into your life? Are you ready for an integrated approach to spirituality that includes your whole feminine self? Are you interested in womb mysteries, herbology, shamanic arts, menstrual phases, moon cycles, and so much more? Well, if this is your love language, then I invite you to join me this month in Rose Gold Goddesses for our Goddess Ichel Circle. She is the Mayan goddess of the womb mysteries, and we dive deep in this two and a half hour circle on all things womb care being self-care, connecting to your divine feminine energy through all sorts of healing modalities that I'll let you see over on the sales page because we're going to really go there. So if you're calling in a deeper approach to spirituality that invites your whole feminine self, then come join us. You can find the link in the show notes, rosegoldgoddesses.com slash Ichel. You can purchase this one circle on its own, or it's included as part of your membership in Rose Gold Goddesses, including all of the other goddesses that we've worked with from Saraswati to Kuan Yin to Kalima to Durga and everyone in between, as well as my e-courses, master Masterclasses, expert guest workshops, member led workshops, and did I mention a community of 2,000 plus spiritual soul sisters? Yes, that is all available for you in Rose Gold Goddesses. So you can find that link in the show notes, and I'm super excited to invite you inside. Welcome, Rose, to the High Soul Podcast. It's so great to have you back. Thank you so much for having me on. I actually can't remember when, when I was, it was oh, like three, three years, years ago. ago. Yeah. So much has changed. I and mean, we're still friends. I know. <laughs> So the first question I'd love to ask you is what makes you your highest self? Right now, I think it it changes. And I think right now it's my friends. You know, I think I have been so fortunate during this time this year that we've, we've been able to, to see each other, hang out, you know, and I'm just, I think that that is where I can tune into that, that frequency where I feel like my highest self. Yeah. I feel recharged and energized and inspired and joyful. It has been everything. And I think it's so important for especially women to have just a friend, group of friends that they can talk to about everything that's happening this year, because it feels like every single day, you know, is all of these different topics, whether they're societal, political, on the news, on the conspiracy theory web, like so many places we're getting so much information right now. And it's really hard, first of all, to decipher what's happening, but then also to like tune into how you're feeling about it and what it's bringing up for you. And then also like having goals throughout it all. It feels like there's this meme I saw and it was this dog like working on his computer and it's like working, hitting your deadlines in 2020. And there's like fire and you got a volcano outside and you're just like on your laptop and like in a way it sort of feels like you know okay like let me focus on my work even though it might feel like things are just so chaotic outside and it has been so just life changing having our little text thread and Uh, being able to like send each other like 15 minute long voice notes yeah what are you moving through and that's why I'm so excited to have you on the podcast today to just have like a girls chat like what I mean we've been talking all day today about all of the things and it's like podcast listeners a lot of them don't have friends they get to talk to about this Mm -hmm. stuff they're they're watching documentaries they're getting information and they're wanting to hear people's opinions and perspectives because it helps us realize our own and you are someone who has helped me get so much clarity because 
I went down a rabbit hole, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I went down that hole. <laughs> Uh, with no Alice in Wonderland on the other end, quite opposite, <laughs> not fun. And I remember I was texting you and Allison, and I was like, "Do you guys know about the deep state and the this and what we're <laughs> yeah. doing?" And then I was like, "And you were like, just notice how you're breathing." And you kind of coached me to connect back to my body. And I know so many listeners have gone down these different documentaries and things that have popped up in 2020 who claim to be telling the truth and this long-standing fear and anxiety that is still in our physical bodies because we haven't done the like purification of it. So yeah. if someone is, is or has gone through a conspiracy theory rabbit hole and is extremely scared right now, what can they do? What I would say is I would say the same thing that I said to you when we were on the phone is to breathe to do a little bit of pranayama, to return back to their body, to do some one to two breathing. So I would inhale for one, exhale for two, or inhale for two, and exhale for four, or inhale for three, and exhale for six. Inhaling and exhaling through your nose can be extremely grounding. And I feel like, for me anyway, anytime I've gone into a anxiety or manic frenetic energy space I realize that I'm not breathing and all of that energy is moving up into your brain all of that blood is rushing into your mind and it's really just creating more of what is creating what your body's feeling and I don't know about you, but I've never made any good decisions when I'm in a state of panic. (laughs) So I think that it's really important for people to learn how to connect with their body, to learn how to identify what that panic or anxiousness or helplessness or fear looks like for them in their body, in in their own state. And I think so much of what's happening is we're being fed information and everybody that's listening to this and all of us like we're all truth seekers right so we're want everybody's wanting to know what the truth is and in a time and in a place where so much of the truth has been curated and you know fucked with like Mm -hmm. it makes it really hard for us to discern what is truth yep and Even the word truth has been turned into a subjective term. Yeah, a hundred percent. And look, and in a way, we're all different, right? It's bio individuality. Like every every single person is different, and beliefs are different, religions are different, you know, and all that is part of what makes this human experience so unique is we get to learn different things. But at the end of the day, we have to really ground ourselves in what is true for us. Like what is the truest, what is the real, the realest, I don't want to sound like a hip hop song, but like what is the truest and most real for you? Mm -hmm. When we think about something like love, you love your partner or you love a sibling or a parent or both your parents. There's no questioning that love. You just no, you just know that you love them. Your your pets, like I don't ever question my love for my people. I just know it's true. I know it's there and hopefully they do as well. When I feel joy, I feel ecstatic. I don't question the joy. I just experience it. When we experience states like fear and anxiety, we're not questioning them either. We're experiencing them because we haven't trained ourselves how to come back to a state of security, right? We feel fear because we don't know, mm-hmm. right? There's no knowing. So anxiety is is coming from not knowing something for sure, uncertainty. And there is a lot of uncertainty in the world. And when we anchor in that uncertainty, it creates for a very terrible existence, you know, especially during a time like we're in now when you're uncertain, it's, it's hard to come back down, so to speak. The only certainty that we 
can create for ourselves is our own truth, is mm-hmm. our own body. And it could be as, as small as putting your hand on the ground underneath you or going outside and getting a breath of fresh air or going to the beach or putting your feet in sand or, or going out and hugging a tree or doing something where you can reconnect to your own humanness, you know? So yeah, I mean, look, I have a lot of opinions and I have a lot of my own assessment of what is happening in the world, but I, I think that we are in a place where we need to pay attention, mm. you know, and I don't want that to sound like alarmist. I think we need to just pay attention. I think there's so much alarmist shit going on right now anyway, where it's like, oh, we need to wake up. We need to do it right now. Everybody yeah. sign this petition. Stop. Da, da, da. And it's just like, oh my goodness. Like, I understand we need to mobilize. We need to change things, but we also need to take care of ourselves, you know? Absolutely. Yes. And I think that what's hard with the uncertainty is there can be groups that take advantage of that. You know, there can be groups that take advantage of people are not sure who to vote for right now. People are not sure who to trust. So let's take something that resonates as true and then tie it into something that is of benefit to our agenda, right? Like, you know, I don't mind getting specific about like certain things right now. Like a lot of people are questioning vaccines, right? That's a very popular topic. We're not here to talk about what your choice is on that, but a lot of people are questioning vaccines, right? So from that area, it will attach it to something else. Well, if you're questioning vaccines, let's question, you know, the greater government. And then from there, who's behind it? And then it leads from one thing to the next. And in that web of things, there can be different agendas, different parties, different things that are thrown in the bucket with that. And because you're in this, uh uh-huh, nod, 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 take Mm -hmm. in, take in. I believed you up to here. I don't really know about this part, but because I've believed you up to here, I might as well say to this next part too, because, you know, who am I? I've been blinded my whole life. They haven't let me know the truth. So they're they're in a way, and I think that's why so much of the spiritual and conscious community has, you know, moved into into this way is because they do take ounces of truth and then tie on these mistruths. Mm -hmm. And because you're in such an anxious and fearful state, you're just willing to believe anything that will make you feel certain at that time. Yeah. And the reason why the wellness community is so prime for the taking is because none of us come to the wellness community because we're well. (laughs) We all crazy. (laughs) You know, I mean, we all come to the wellness community because we are seeking something. Mm -hmm. And so for a lot of people, it, God, I mean, it's like, how deep do I want to get? I, I never talk about this, you know, mm-hmm. in public. I have my own opinions and, and people who obviously follow me know how I feel about certain things. But one of the most powerful things that we can do is have our own opinion. Mm-hmm. And we acquire our own opinion by doing homework and by truly assessing. What's not happening in that is our own connection to our own response to it. I'm doing, okay, let's say I'm doing research. I'm going down the YouTube rabbit hole and I'm doing my research, you know? I'm old school, you know? I I come from a place where I used to do a research paper in the library and I used to pull an index card and I would write my resources down and I had to read a book or read a, a handful of books. I had to look up articles and I had to really do some work. It wasn't as easy as watching a YouTube video of, of cliff notes, you know, which I, I, I remember did we weren't even allowed to use the internet as like a source. Yeah. You couldn't. Yeah. It was it, it, debatable. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, you might be able to, I don't know. Some teachers were okay with it. Some, some weren't. But what that helped me learn is truth feels different. And Just because something sounds good, it doesn't mean it's true. Mm -hmm. Just because something sounds like it could be true, doesn't mean it's true. And here's the thing. 
I don't think the majority of people are sitting around like, hey, how do we lie to people because we're just fucked up, you know? Or even like we just want to get a bunch of clicks. I actually don't think that's the majority. I think that people genuinely with the information they've been handed think they're making the best choice. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, and I because agree. they feel passionate about this, they're going out there and creating content and sharing. And that's what social media creates. It's these echo chambers. So if you're in one echo chamber, you're going to keep getting more articles, more interviews, more information to claim that exact same finding. Whereas if I'm in a totally different one, we're coming from completely different worlds. So you would look at me and be like, oh my God, you're so crazy. Where'd you get that from? And I'm like, no, you're so crazy. Where'd you get that from? It's because we're both finding all of the quote unquote sources to right. match whatever echo chamber exactly. we're in. A hundred percent. And I think that you said something so key is the fight between I'm right, I'm right. And that's where, that's where we get lost. Yep. That's, you can't convince somebody else to change their belief system. You know, that's why. In, in fact, I would say that's the definition of entitlement. A hundred percent. And that's where there is no growing. There's nothing. You can't go from a place of, I need you to believe what I believe. I'm going to try and convince you. I have a good argument. And it's like, people can debate and argue all day long, but at the end of the day, if we can't accept the fact that other people have different values and beliefs that we do, we're never, we're never going to move through this no. ever. Yeah. And you know, a lot of people are struggling with their friends mm -hmm. being super well, like politically members. different right now. Family members being super different. I think with family members, it's almost like that's always been the case. So it's a little bit more like, but I'm seeing a lot of friendships, like, like, you know, we might be vibing completely and we're choosing to be friends. And then suddenly you end up on that one echo chamber and uh -huh. I'm in another. So we're seeing the whole world, the election, everything in these two totally different ways. And it's super important to not lose friendships over this yeah. because understand why that person came to that conclusion, what the other side wants, but then also be able to tap out of it because it's, again, this illusion, the social media tunnel that makes you think that the entire world is collapsing. And if you acquire enough information and spend enough time on social media doing so, then somehow you're going to be the one to figure out your way through it. I think for me, my biggest realization was like, I'm never going to figure this all out. I need to just focus on living my life. Yeah. And so many, everybody needs to do that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, I think if we focused on living our lives more, we would stop focusing on how we're all so different. Mm -hmm. You know, look, there's a lot of things going on right now. And, and I think just to, you know, preface this conversation in, we're talking about like the conspiracy theory rabbit hole. We're talking about politics, you know, we're talking about these things specifically because, Obviously, it's a pressing topic at the moment, and it's taken over a lot of people's conversations. When we stop considering other people's opinions and positions, we stop our own ability to continue to grow. Mm -hmm. I think we have to find each other's humanness and how we can continue to connect and how we can create a, a different way of being. Obviously, what we've been doing isn't working. Yes, there needs to be change. Yes, there needs to be reform. Yes, things need to be brought to the forefront. But it's still very important. It always has been historically. I mean, these things have happened historically throughout the ages of time. This is no different. Mm -hmm. What we can do for ourselves is to anchor in what we know is true do the things that we need to do in order to keep our sanity and keep our health and keep our relationships. It's been such a sad thing to see a lot of relationships dissolve because of it, you know. And I think it's 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 unfortunate, you know, that people are willing to throw away years and years and years of friendships and relationships because of their position on a specific topic. You know, I I found myself in the same position. There's a friend of mine who, yeah, we have different politics. That's never been the case. That's never been an issue for us in the past. But there was something specific that happened, you know, during the riots where, you know, she comes from a family of law enforcement and she felt that it was very, she just didn't agree with, with my positioning of how I felt. And um, 
and look, I've not been public about how I feel and I'm still not going to. And I have my own reasons to why I don't publicly like to talk about it. I have family members that are also in law enforcement. I've also been on the other side of the law Mm -hmm. (laughs) where I was the person getting arrested. So I have a, a very specific view on that. But this friend was just having an issue with something that I had said on Instagram and she was very hurt by it. And we had a conversation and and I said, look, I, I have the right to feel how I do, as do you, but that doesn't mean that we can't be friends and that the last 15 years of our relationship is now ceases to exist because you're saying that all of a sudden that specific statement, now I've changed. Mm. Now I'm a different person. It's like, no, this is still the same person that yeah, showed that up for you. Yeah, she just never heard that opinion of yours. Yeah, yeah. and it, how is that one thing going to then shatter 15 years of history that yeah. we have? And and that's what, you know, whatever you call it, the forces that be, whatever. Right. That's what they want. Yeah. They want people to stop being friends, to f- hate each other, to police each other. We can't give into that duality. Yeah, I totally agree. And fortunately, we were able to, you know, have more conversations after that. And where it stands now, like, we're taking some space, you know, where it's literally like a like a relationship. You know, yeah. we've talked about this before. We're we're on a little bit of a break until after November, you know, <laughs> and then we will we will go back, I'm sure, to our relationship and how it was. But I think it's really important for most people won't have that conversation, you right. know, like most would just, you know, give you the cold shoulder and not tell you. Yeah, why. and that's it. And I think that that is the absolute most abusive thing that you can do to a person is mm-hmm. like to give them the silent treatment. Yeah. And you know, it's gaslighting them. They're questioning, what did I do? And yeah. they don't even know it could have been because of an Instagram post. Yeah. And I think, you know, somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago, like what I would say to somebody that I didn't agree with, like what words in yogic terms, what are your like words of wisdom to somebody that's being, you know, totally against what you believe and they're, they believe the opposite And I said, I wouldn't say anything. I would just listen. I would listen to them. And I think that that's the biggest thing that's not happening right now is that we're not listening to the other side, you know? I think that we can also get really wrapped up in our own bubble Mm -hmm. that we forget like, oh, there's somebody else that has a different opinion than mine and I should listen to them, you know, because that's still giving them the opportunity to express themselves. And if we are in the wellness community, then it's wellness for all, not just wellness for the ones that believe in the same thing I do. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I have, I have a lot of opinions, obviously, like we've talked about this at length many times and it's hard to lose somebody to a conspiracy hole <laughs> or, you know, a, a, or the other side too, or the other side that's yeah. very righteous, that really believes that, yeah. you know, these people are quacks or whatever, yeah. or that it's crazy to believe that anything you know, besides mainstream. Exactly. And that's what I think. Like, I feel like people kind of like quote unquote wake up and they start to notice these conspiracies and it's very the 4D of like questioning, like, are we in this matrix? Is this real? Like da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. And it can get very, very fear-based and chaotic. And then that 5D perspective is like, it's all love. It truly all is, even though it seems like chaos. This person also wants what's best for the world. Her experiences will make her think it's this way. But again, it's like knowing that everyone most people truly do want what's best for the world. And if you can come at it with compassion rather than you must be wrong, you're full of shit. Like I had the same thing with one of our mutual friends during in June when I was posting things about, you know, the riots, et cetera. And she really didn't like, you know, because she was friends with someone that their store got rioted. So she was very against the riots, right? Mm -hmm. And I was saying how it's more of like people are expressing how they feel. It's the language of the unheard. Again, I'm not saying everyone should riot at all, but I'm understanding it. And she was offended. And I could see quickly that this text conversation could turn into a really big fight and a dissolving of our relationship, Mm -hmm. which I really didn't want. So I was like, call me. We talked on the phone and it actually made us become closer friends Mm -hmm. because she was able to see, oh, because it was online, I felt like you were coming at it with this really like militant energy. And I was like, well, I feel like you were coming at me with this really militant energy because it's online and there's no voice and there's Mm -hmm. no cue. And now her and I are closer than we ever have been because we were able to get through that hump. 
you know, and it doesn't mean I've changed my views or she's changed hers, but I think that most people are not courageous enough yeah, to have that but conversation. That's, you had, that's such an important thing, actually, is such a key thing is to have a dialogue that's not a post on Facebook right. or an, on Instagram because those things never, ever, ever pan out. Or it's like you can't read emotion the via comment text. comment wars. Like, has anyone yeah. really ever changed their political views because someone yelled at them on a Facebook comment? Never. never. Not once. Well, it's, I, I find it akin to when somebody's like, calm down. Right. Like, I've never, in fact, when when I'm... Calm down. Okay, I'm calm down. Yeah, it's like, I've never... Tori and I talk about this all the time. It is so triggering for me when somebody tells me to calm down. It's like, rile up. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It it does the absolute opposite, you know? So I think we need to learn to use our words differently and to utilize the healing energy of our voice. And, you know, listening to somebody's voice that you love or care about, you know, releases oxytocin in your system and it creates a bonding agent. And so when we're able to have a conversation that creates that connection with somebody else, leaving a voice note, I mean, like, you know, our little text thread, like we're always leaving voice notes, we're always connecting. And I think, even if we don't agree on everything, the fact that we're there and, you know, here's a really great way to have a conversation with somebody that you love that is, doesn't have the same views that you do. You start the conversation by saying, I love you. I will always love you. I'm here for you and that nothing and no one will ever change that. But I want to talk to you about something that I'm feeling or these things that I'm reading are really affecting me, or I really believe that more people should know about X or Y or Z. To open the dialogue in a safe space to really create that container for that person. I mean, think about it for yourself. If, you know, I'm, I'm assuming that the people, you know, that are listening to this podcast are people that are into wellness and spirituality and are, are wanting to create a better place we're always going to be the ones that have to initiate and we should never resent that. I think it's important for the people that are awake enough to have that conversation and initiate that conversation, start it from a place of love because it's really difficult to argue with somebody that starts out of the gate telling you how much they love you. Yeah. Versus someone who's like, you know, I think people get passive aggressive and they know that person doesn't agree with them and they just keep sending them articles. Yes. You know? like, like what Tori does. That's what he does. And yeah. I'm like, don't do that. That's so weird. You right. know, like I had somebody doing that to me, just like randomly sending me. It pisses you off. I'm just like, what? Do you think I don't read? Like I read the news. Like I get it. I try not to engage, but I know what's going on in the world, you know, but at the, again, Oh, it's such a, we need, we need empathy. We need conversation. We need, we need facial expressions. All of the things that come body language, like online genuinely is not the space to have these types of conversations. Not at all. And, and that's where I really miss having a studio or having a place where we could all get together and, now it's online and I think that, thank God for having virtual places. Zoom or like, at least, yeah. you have some video contact. Yes, yeah. exactly. You can have the connection via that way. But just to your point, having empathy and having that connection, I think it also, it can't just be empathy. I think it needs to be empathy and compassion mm-hmm. because so many people are suffering and the whole basis of compassion, it's like empathy without compassion is useless. And, I, and I've said that before and I've had people come after me and that's fine if you want to come after me for saying that, but that's my belief. I think that if you have empathy alone, in my opinion, it has to be paired with compassion because empathy is like, I feel your pain. I feel where you're coming from. I can, I can truly feel that. But compassion is, I have a desire for your pain to stop. So not only do I feel for you, I feel with you. But I, I have a genuine desire from the core of my being for you to not suffer. And I think if we had more compassion for what's happening in the world right now, for the people that are part of this system that are just being fed information and they're not in a good place, mm-hmm. even the information, if you're being fed, listen, If you're being fed information that's making you feel some kind of way, I'm not saying what's right, what's wrong, what's red, what's blue. I'm saying if you are reading and taking in, consuming information that's in your body, making you feel bad, 
then you need to stop reading it Mm -hmm. or engaging with it because you need to be, just going back to what we said in the beginning, in order for you to discern what is right and what is real for you, you need to be in a good space. Right. Right. And so that's the whole yoga as a whole. The whole purpose of practicing yoga is to cultivate discernment Mm -hmm. so that I know what to do when I'm not on my mat. Because when I'm on my mat, I'm good. I'm moving. I'm doing my Surya Surya A's. I'm like tuning in to my highest self. I'm in my blissful state. But it's coming off of the mat that is really where the yoga comes in, right? It's the whole story of the Bhagavad Gita. It's the journey of the yogi. It's like, what do I do in the real world? How do I take my practice, my meditation practice, my dance practice, my mermaid practice, you know, whatever it may be, how do I take that out into the world and cultivate more of that connection with with my fellow human being as opposed to just, you know, coming from a place of spurned anger all the time and disconnection and you're different from me. So my experience is more valid than yours. Mm -hmm. That's not the way that's not, you know, and some people can say that that's spiritual bypass and whatever. That's fine. That's your opinion. I don't think that that's true, you know, to approach things from a, a grounded, awake space of cultivating discernment because you need to know what discernment just means. I know what is best for me. Right. Right. So how do you know what's best for you? How many people do you know, or do you, do you to message you that they say they don't know what to do? Yeah. So many every day. And it's like, okay. I mean, I've been that person. You've been that person. Mm -hmm. And what do we do when we don't, when we don't know something? I think you ask everyone else and hope they have an answer for you. (laughs) Yeah. Most of the time you do some investigating, you do some recon, Mm -hmm. you know, you do some researching, you ask, well, I would hope you ask wise teachers, you ask people that have been there before, you inquire in in sacred texts, Mm -hmm. you, you know, watch YouTube videos, hopefully that are, you know, Good to inspire while breathing, you. while breathing, <laughs> while noticing how yeah. your body if, feels, if while wa- noticing if it makes you feel bad. Yeah. See, and and also what I do want to add with the makes you feel bad, don't watch it. It's like you're not saying disconnect yeah. from the news because I don't think the news has ever truly made us feel good. It's just the nature of the world of Kali Yuga of. You know, it's not 2020, 2019. There was also gun violence and all these other issues. Most people just weren't listening. I did a podcast episode on gun violence. It's my least listened to episode ever because because no one wants to hear that. We you know, tag it on this one. We should tag <laughs> yeah, it on I'll that. tag it. I'll tag it. Please listen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not to disconnect yourself. It's when you're at this point that you're feeling so beat up and helpless. That's not helping because you can't be of service anymore. You can only kind of take these things in doses. And for some people, that dose might be once a day. For some people, it might be every couple weeks, you know? And that's going to depend on what your dharma is, how your energy body is, where you are in your spiritual journey, and most importantly, what you're doing with that thing right now. Like Marianne Williamson needs to know every single day because her dharma is to be fully in it, in the ring, politically. And she has a very, very strong energy body. She can handle that, you know? Someone who's going through a divorce right now, who's dealing with all sorts of things, who doesn't even know what how to find clarity in their own life, and now to take on everything that's happening in the world, that's going to be way too much. They need to focus on their own pond first. So this is where discernment comes back. What can you handle right now? And then how can you actually be of service in that way? And for some people, they might have kids, they're homeschooling right now you don't need to fix the problems of the world. Uh You know, I think that that's what people really need to understand. Like we don't, I think because of social media, we think the only way to help people is to like be an online activist. And like, it's not, we're just only having the exposure to that. So we think that that's how we help. We saw so many of these social media activism things that ended up being fraud or performance oriented Mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So maybe your greatest form of service is to just like sit with your kids while you're homeschooling them during the day and like help them get through their stuff. And like that could just be more than enough for you. Yeah, no, totally agree. 
Yes. It's really focusing on what is going to be the best thing for you in that moment. Because I'm like, did I say, I don't know if I said it, but we were talking about how, you know, our brain technology has evolved. Our brain has not. Our brain is still the same brain it's been. You know, our ability to adapt and take information in has evolved somewhat, but it's still a lot for a little person to take in. I mean, it's just so much, so much stuff coming at us constantly. Our brain cannot process. I mean, there's been so many scientific studies that have shown that our brain cannot process all of the information we put in it in an hour with all the computer, phone, everything that's coming in. So to give ourselves an opportunity to integrate, I think is is really key in cultivating more of that discernment and doing practices that are going to help you recenter in that core of who you are so that when you are going down a rabbit hole, you can recognize, oh, I'm not breathing. It's like the moment I said- Or I'm, I'm hooked, you know? Yeah. I need to watch the next video and the next one. And, you know, and this is what oftentimes these, not just conspiracy, the mainstream media does this too. It makes you feel like you don't know anything. Yeah. It makes you question all of your beliefs. Well, and let's be honest, their whole- gimmick is to keep you watching so everything is a hook everything is a hook everything on social media is a hook it's all a funnel like it's all a fucking funnel like it's all funneling you you, you were talking about how you used to watch these conspiracy theory videos like way back in like early 2000s or whatever and like you would be two and a half hours in you're like wait they still haven't revealed any truth yeah (laughs) it's like oh here's the truth behind in the next episode (laughs) yeah and it's the same it's like the whole i'm like i've literally been watching this for two and a half hours and it's just like the dramatic music Music and the really aesthetically pleasing, like old Egyptian, you know, symbols and, you know, shit that's interesting that makes yeah. you keep wanting and, to watch. And ounces of truth too. I'm like, you know, I watched one of the ones, I'm not going to say its name on YouTube, that a lot of people are watching and it's extremely fear inducing. Yes. But it's like, why did that have to be nine parts? Just you could have just set the whole thing in like a one video exactly. thing. But it's like, you got all of those views, all those people continuing to click. And it's like, yeah, there's someone who's sitting behind these and making them. Yeah. Keep that in mind. And I'm not just talking about conspiracy theories. I'm talking about even the social dilemma documentary. Mm-hmm. There's someone sitting and making that too. That's you know, right. so it's like I talked about this on my last solo cast, but I feel like right now there's this big divide over censorship. And there's like this, you know, a lot of the people are saying that Facebook and Instagram are overly censored. We can't question anything. We can't give other viewpoints. Why are they censoring us? There must be truth to this because if it wasn't true, then they wouldn't censor us. So there's that whole like red pill movement right now that's kind of happening of like- Oh, like the matrix? Like yeah, red- like the oh, matrix see, and they're taking the red pill. It's what they call it. So then there's this <laughs> other movement, which is like the social dilemma, et cetera, which are saying that these conspiracy theories that aren't fact checked or quote unquote fake news is being spread like rapid fire and it can be very dangerous. It could have cult psychology in it. And Facebook needs to have more censorship to make sure that this isn't being shared in the algorithm. Both things make sense, right? We don't want to not be able to speak the truth and we also don't want hate to be shared. Right. But what is true? Yeah. Well, to me, it's it's the censorship is a really slippery slope because it's like, do I want people spreading misinformation out into the world? Hell no. Do I think it needs to be regulated? The question is yes. regulated by who? Yeah, but that's the thing. That's, that's what I like it, about podcasting. I put the shit up. No one's in between me and the podcast. You know, yeah. imagine if I had a company, they would be like, oh, yo, Sahara, you're getting a little too cray. I mean, this just happened with Joe Rogan. You know, like Joe Rogan is known for really questioning mainstream norms, et cetera. And I know something happened this week that he was he was questioning the fires and potentially how they started, et cetera. And he had to give an apology for doing that because they said that that wasn't fact checked, et cetera. Again, we don't want misinformation being spread. He's a super powerful person. If he says something, all of these other people might believe it. There could, if he's told everyone to do something really violent, people might do it. I understand the power of that, you know? And so now where do we draw the line? Yeah. You know, who gets to be the official fact checker? Yeah, who is in charge of moderating, Yeah, right? Like who's in charge and what's their 
And what's their business? What's their agenda? Like, that's the one thing I liked about the social dilemma. It's like social media is a business and you are the product. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that. And I think we forget, we think it's this like social media, I get to share my true self. And it's like, "Mm, no, it's a business model. And what you are shown is extremely curated. I mean, but that's been happening since, look, it's been happening since the beginning of time, right? I'm not the beginning of time. They didn't have, you know, the cavemen did not have social media, but they had myths being shared and they probably stories and and different. I mean, what is, what is religion? You know, like their stories that have been curated for us to shape our values and our beliefs. And that's a beautiful thing, you know, but it's never been done to the scale. And apropos to the social dilemma, they did talk about how it's never been done at this scale. And look, I my whole thing that I've always said and in, in what I believe is, you know, I've always been a good, well, not interviewer, but like I ask questions. I love asking questions. And I'm always going to inquire about things, especially things that I can't see, you know, and and I don't, I'm of the belief that, you know, you just have to, you just have to question things. You just have to ask questions. I mean, that's what makes us different than animals. And and questioning doesn't mean the, oh, well, where'd you get that factor? Where's your source on that? Where's it this? Where's it that? Like, I feel like a lot of people think it's it's that, but it's like, again, who made these sources? Who funded these sources? Who funded this research? Like, it's not, that's the thing that's tricky with us is like, we're trying to cling on to like, what's this board of truth? It's like why we created the UN. We're like, okay, all these governments are going so ham. We need some sort of international government who can be non-biased, but look how it turned out. It's still completely biased. So I think that's what we're, we're all globally figuring out. I trust that we will eventually, but it's a completely new territory for us. And especially with bots being created to spread misinformation. So a lot of the different conspiracy theories out there, there are bots who are programmed to keep spreading them. So we're like, oh my God, it's going viral. No, someone created that to go viral. Yeah. Well, I remember somebody sent me a a specific company video and the first thing I saw, I'm like, wow, 6 million views. And it just makes you want to click, you know, because I'm like, oh, 6 million people have watched this. And then come to find out that said video had a lot of purchase buys, download buys. And I'm like, oh, well, that makes it easier to click on this because I feel like, well, everybody else is doing it. It's, it's like if someone thing. has a lot of followers, you assume, oh, I'll follow them because, because they, other people good. are following them. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, just because they've got, you know, a million followers, it means that they're a guru or whatever. And that's the shadow side of that. But then the other side is like, do we go back to like the news where there's like six channels that are all owned by the same company and you like can't speak outside no, of it? No, look, I, yeah. I think that this is a very tall... It's the wild, wild west. Yeah, it's a very <laughs> tall order for us to try and like discuss even on this podcast. You know, I, I will, will never pontificate to know what is right and what is wrong or who or what or where is the information. I I think people need to start, you know, asking, inquiring within. Inquire within. You know? And connect to your joy too. It's like, we're talking about all this stuff and it's super, super heavy. And like what we always come down to and we kind of come back and talk about is at the end of the day, what matters is how you feel and how you're living your life because the world is going to continue to do whatever the world is going to do. And eventually we do need to unplug from it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And because a lot of it, if we think that my happiness is dependent on who the president is, or my happiness is dependent on what's going to happen in, in this, this, that we're not fully stepped into our sovereignty yet. Because, you know, for example, my parents escaped from a revolution, right? Like, imagine if they waited around saying, you know, we're just going to wait till like the government changes and things. They they would still be there and their lives would not have changed. They had to take their own control and say, we're going to go create our own reality right now and and start from scratch in doing so because we don't want to wait for someone else to be our problem solver. So I think it's like we get to all realize that, you know, and I think for me, I like to delete my Instagram for a couple of days, a week, come back to it. And I've realized that when I delete my Instagram, all of these things that I'm so worried and stressed and trying to, it, they're gone. They're actually not mm-hmm. in my present reality. Yeah. They're other people's opinions and stories and things that are being essentially sent over to me on the internet, but it's not here in my reality. Like if we actually 
didn't have the internet this year, 2020 would have gone down a very, very, very different way. I don't know how, but I don't think the amount of stress and anxiety would have been there. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Unplugging is such a healing experience because it brings you back down to this, you know, so many people I'm seeing wanting to move out to like a farm or a ranch or people want to connect with nature. And I think nature is still such a healing remedy for so many. And, And look, some people can't go outside yet or some people still feel like, they're in fear, but I'm telling you, fresh air, seeing some green, walking around, moving your body, unplugging from technology, even for a short while, can really create an incredible shift in your mood, your energy, your health, your happiness, your ability to remember who and what you are. I mean, that's the whole process of yoga and meditation and dance and and breath work and all these incredible practices that we do. You know, it's we can't do them while we're doing something else. You mm-hmm. have to do them, right? It's like I can't meditate and go on Instagram, you know. I have to meditate and then go on Instagram or, you know, this our time is so limited. It really is there's 1,440 minutes in a day and they go by quickly. You know, we think about it in terms of just our time on this planet, you know, and I say that in, in, again, not to be morbid, but in a way to just reflect, there's this quote, your love is how you spend your time. And I think about that often because Whenever I'm going down a rabbit hole or I'm doing whatever I'm doing and I'm mindlessly going throughout my day and I feel totally disconnected to my body, I haven't taken a shower, it's like four o'clock in the afternoon and I'm still like doing nothing productive, I start to think, wow, like what did I do today that made me connect to joy or to my happiness or to love? Like, what did I do? And instead of sitting there and then making myself feel bad, like, oh, I wasted a whole day. The day's over. I just want to wait until tomorrow. I stop doing what I'm doing. I, I shut the computer down. I grab the dogs. I go for a walk around the block. And then I take a shower. And then I instantly feel better. I instantly feel better. I feel totally refreshed, renewed, and reconnected to what is real. I mean, I think about you know, there's a, a friend of mine who recently got some not great news. She she got diagnosed with a very scary type of cancer. And, you know, we've been kind of chatting and, and, you know, she's got a great team. She's got a great support system. And, you know, the conversation that we had did not involve anything that's going on in the world. Mm. Not, we were on for, I don't know, maybe like a, two hours Not at one point did we discuss anything that was happening in the world. We were talking about her, the last vacation she went on, which was like two years ago. She was talking about her two-year-old. She's got a two-year-old daughter. Her first word was a curse word. (laughs) So she was talking about that. And, you know, she was talking about how her mom was annoying her because of what's happening. And she's like, it's not like I'm dead. You know, like she's like, I got a diagnosis. We're going to fight it and we're going to be okay. And it just, that conversation, although it was heavy to hear that information, we still, we had a normal conversation about life and about, we were laughing and we were making jokes and we were just, having a good conversation that didn't revolve around anything heavy because it was something heavy pressing. And so let's imagine that the state of the world right now is really heavy because it is, you know, we have a very bad diagnosis right now. Mm -hmm. And I think we should spend our time doing things that are going to make us better, that are going to make us connect in a deeper way that are going to, help us connect with other people, even people that we don't want to connect with. But before we even go there, I think it's important for us to get ourselves in in a good space. A lot of the times we mistake 
that statement to, well, I'm going to fix everybody else. Mm -hmm. And you can't transmit something that you don't have. So really focusing on what matters to you the most. You know, I think about that for myself. I'm like, wow, you know, I went to bed that night thinking like, oh, like if that were me, like I'm not worried about what I'm going to fucking post on Instagram or like, (laughs) or, you know, like if my book's going to be on the New York Times or whatever, I'm worried about spending time with my family and my friends and just being able to see another sunset and being able to see another full moon or being able to, you know, like be in the pool and like be with my boyfriend and just talk about nothing, you know? We'll take a quick break so I can give a shout out to our sponsors. Since March, so many more people have been searching for immune boosters. And one of my favorite Ayurvedic companies, Banyan Botanicals, ended up running out. So they realized they needed to create a brand new custom formula that's for the present moment. And that's how they came up with Immune Health Now. So it combines various Ayurvedic ingredients to bolster the body's natural defenses, support the lungs and respiratory tract, and promote mental calmness, which are all things we could use during these uncertain times. Plus, they plan to adapt and evolve the formula depending on the highest quality herbs for the immune system they have available, truly making it an herbal supplement for the present moment. So they sell out all the time. So be sure to pick up your immune health now, now. While you're at it, check out Banyan for their awesome Ayurvedic content. And you can also save 20% off immune health now at banyanbotanicals.com slash Sahara. I have that link in the show notes and you'll love this product. It's officially fall, vata season, and you know what that means, pumpkin spice everything. So if you're a High Self podcast listener, you probably love pumpkin spice lattes, but you probably don't love the sugar, the dairy, etc. that goes into them. Well, I have something just for you. So I've been talking about Organifi products for a really long time, but this season they have their special pumpkin spice gold recipe, which is insane. It has turmeric, ginger, reishi mushroom, lemon balm, turkey tail mushroom, allspice, It literally tastes like a pumpkin spice latte without the sugar plus all of the superfoods. So you can find this in all of their other incredible products, including their gold chocolate, their green, their red juice, so many wonderful things to keep your immune system really healthy, strong, and vibrant, and also help you with just the stress levels that we're experiencing right now over on their website at Organifi.com using coupon code Sahara for your 20% discount. That's Organifi, O-R-G-A-N-I-F. FI.com with coupon code Sahara and you can find that link in the show notes. Mm, so beautifully shared. Thank you for that. And I think it really puts things into perspective because I think a lot of us have put our lives on pause this year. You know, the way that kind of coronavirus came on, it was sort of like, okay, we're going to take this two week pause and then things are going to go back to normal. And that two weeks became a month, two months. Here we are seven months in. What's difficult, I think, is there was never really a like, okay, we can go back. It's like a weird, very prolonged fight, right? It's like, are we cool now or or not? It's like, you know, I I see people, a lot of people are confused. They're like, wait, like, you know, some of my friends have still not seen a single person since March because they're like, well, that's what we were you know, told to do. And, you know, and and some people do have immune issues or or all sorts of things too, that this is extremely serious for them and they can't, you know, my grandfather, you know, he's at the end of his life right now. And it's really sad because I can't see him because there's a risk of me seeing him. And then also sad because he might die very soon because he's 94 years old and I won't be able to, like my grandma, I didn't get to go to her funeral. So it's like also this, this heaviness with it. And I think what's, difficult for us is because we've put our lives on hold. We haven't been thinking about the sunsets. We haven't been thinking about our joy. We haven't been thinking about our dharma because we've just been in this baseline survival mode. And we don't know when this is going to end and we don't know what the next stage is going to look like. So it's like we each individually just get to bring back those things that made us happy. And, you know, we were just chatting about this, but I think a lot of the spiritual community right now is very focused on shadow work. This term shadow work is a huge it's a huge buzzword right now. I mean, we've known about this this word and this topic for a lot of years and doing shadow work and going into our fears has been an instrumental part of our journeys and continually. It's not a one-time process, it's a lifelong journey. And 
what I feel like the world really needs right now too, is to go into your joy. Because I think if the world is so heavy right now, as it is, fires, natural disasters, politics, all sorts of things. And then we're all sitting in like our deepest, darkest traumas by ourselves without community. And we look outside, you can't even see the sun because of the smoke. Like that is a recipe for a downward spiral, you know? And it's like, it's not about like, okay, just keep going into it, keep going into it. It's like, you go into it, you come back up for air and you're like, why am I doing this in the first place? I'm doing this so I could live a better life. So when are we going to put that focus, even just for a bit of time into living that better life? Yeah, no, that's 100%. I don't know what the fad has been like setting up camp in that shadow world. I don't know if that's like a new thing. Mm. You know, I'm I'm kind of old school in the whole you do some shadow work and then you go and you live your life and you you know, you kind of for me anyway in my experience it's been that you have see it's seasonal, right? And I'm not saying a whole entire season like, oh, all of summer I was in shadow and now I'm like going to be happy and now hey, if that works for you great, but but we definitely do not set up camp there. Some people can really go into this space because it's familiar. They're mm-hmm. just used to being in shadow work. And I, I don't think that shadow work is safe for everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that, look, I I have my own opinions about how I feel about shadow work and, and how it's kind of a trending topic and I'm I'm still of the mindset that you do shadow work with, you know, people that are experienced, you know, a shaman, a healer, somebody who's who's been experienced in the space, a psychotherapist, mm-hmm. you know, like somebody who has gone to school EMDR, and yeah, yeah, like practices that people have been teaching for a long time. And and I think that it's important for for yeah, people, I mean, look, you can't have light without the dark, you can't have dark without the light. Mm -hmm. And I think it's all truly about finding that balance for yourself and really not setting up camp there. Like you don't have to live there. And, and just because, you know, your, your virtual guru is telling you that you need to keep doing the shadow work when you've not seen anybody and you are feeling completely isolated and you feel totally alone, like I would say probably not a good time for you to be doing that right now. But look, I'm not a qualified psychotherapist or anything, but I'm just, in my opinion, speaking practically, just as any person, if you're in a in a space where you're feeling disconnected and isolated and, and sad and doing shadow work is creating a huge level of anxiety for you, then maybe you should stop. Yeah. Even just for a little bit, like give yourself a break. It's just like we were talking about going down the conspiracy rabbit hole. Like just stop, like disconnect, unplug the computer for a little bit. Yeah. And I think it comes down to, again, our dualistic minds want to label you're either a light worker or a shadow worker. You can't be both. Oh, like, really? I've not you, heard this. Yeah. It's sort of like, I feel like it's like, it was very like, manifestation, like Abraham Hicks, like positive, think positive, think positive. And then people realizing, well, you can't just think positive. Like you get to go into your fears and realize what's underneath them. Like like that's how you grow. And then people are like, oh, wow. So I can't just think positive. I got to also go into my shadows. And, you know, and then I think everyone's in this journey right now too, especially because we're by ourselves in this intense time. So that's perpetuating that. But I think that if you are in the space too, we need more people also holding that light grid yeah. of like, not everyone you talk to can be like, hey, let's talk about the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to you in your whole entire life. Like there are some people who are meant to be there. You know, some people really play in those realms well, like that is part of their dharma. And some people are like, you know, like you don't want your Zumba teacher to you become your shadow work teacher. Like your Zumba teacher is here to teach you Zumba. Like your, your whatever, your piano teacher is here to do this. Like your Akashic Records person is here to be this channel. Like, so let's not jump into these trends of this is the right way to be spiritual. This is the right way to do the quote unquote work oh, right Lord. now and let ourselves be where we're being called to be. Like for myself, I, you know, 
especially when I went into that that rabbit hole. I'm like, this is not my realm. Not it at all. I'm a joy priestess. I'm here to bring joy. I'm here to bring embodiment. I'm here to bring dance. I'm here to bring connecting back to earth. And there will be a group of people who will need that. And there will be a group of people who need the shadow work. And there'll be a group of people who need whatever it is. So, you know, know yourself and then also be brave enough to stand into what it is that you really believe in. Because, yeah, even in the 1920s, you know, or whenever the Great Depression was 1920s or 30s, like there were still jazz players. There are still speakeasies. There is still art. You know, they didn't all stop because the world was in a very depressing place. You know, we need people always to bring joy and laughter and love to the world. And what a beautiful thing if you get to do that. Yeah. Now more than ever. I mean, like there's been so many, like how, how come we're not seeing like the good stories of, you know, people helping each other and, you know, the stories of, you know, like there was this group of officers in, I think it was Houston that were protecting the protesters or, you know, it's like the stuff that really creates that warming sensation where you remember that humans are at their core good, you know, like, yeah, there are bad people in the world, 100%. And I can name probably like 10 right now, but there are good people and there's still beautiful things that this earth has to offer us and our ability to connect with our highest self and our joy and our happiness is still going to be 10 times more powerful than any fear and anxiety that can be produced by some external factor or internal factor. It's just like everything else. Look, we've had an entire majority of the year to practice uncertainty, anxiety, and fear. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because yeah, we've been in that weird limbo of like, are we cool? Are we not cool? Are we going out now? Like, what do we do? Are we hugging? Are we not hugging? Like, what's the deal? Even you meet someone, you're like, uh, namaste, fist bump. Like, I don't even know how to engage. And and because you want people to become, because we want to respect everybody else's feeling. But at the end of the day, like, Tune in to, look, be safe, obviously. Like, don't go out there to a fucking COVID party like they're doing. But it's important for you to just listen and tune in to yourself and what it is that you really want and what's going to create that level of joy and happiness for you. I mean, you posted a a little TikTok right right before you came over. And I was, I had to replay it like four or five times because I thought it was like so perfect. You're talking about connecting to that childlike play. And I know that it's something that Shaman Durek talks about a lot, you know, like that connecting to that childlike play. A couple of coloring books back there that sometimes like I'll get my colors and I'll just start, you know, coloring, you know, or I'll, I'll go and bounce a ball outside, like just to get myself out of the norm of just sitting at a computer and moving in a rigid way Mm -hmm. to just cultivate that, that right side hemisphere brain to reconnect us to that space of like, Oh, right. I'm a human. I'm a, I'm a spiritual being living in a human body. And how can we connect more to that essence of us? How can we expand more into that that movement, that creativity, that ability to move and connect and be happy. Like, where's our happiness? Mm -hmm. Like, where's our happiness right now? Where's our happiness as a community? Where's our happiness as a culture, as a society, as a country? Like, I know that's a very loaded question to ask, but ask that question. Like, how about for you, the individual, like, where is your happiness? What makes you happy? And when was the last time you did something to make you happy? Like genuinely happy. When was the last time you laughed? You laughed so hard that your stomach hurt, you know, like that kind of thing where we've just haven't experienced it very much this year. And, and I think it's time, like now is the time. I think now is the time we've, you know, we've done so much of this deep, deep work and we need the other side right now because it's not going to be balanced if all we do is just like sit around and think about what's wrong with the world. We need, we need to 
be the sun, you know, just as much as there's the moon, there's the sun and cultivating, you know, I call it being the sun being like being the embodiment of the sun that brings warmth and light and nourishment to the whole world. And isn't like, Oh, that part's shadowy. I'm not going to put my sunlight over there. It's like, no, regardless, you just offer your sunlight and whoever wants it can have it. And whoever doesn't, that's fine too. You're, you're going to, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, <laughs> you know, like yeah. keep living your life that way. And I think that true. we're afraid of people saying, oh, well, you're spiritual bypassing or like you're not doing the work or whatever. It's like, let people say whatever they're going to say. We're all fucking uncertain right now. Me and Rosie are uncertain too. We're totally. all uncertain. We are not the word. We're not giving you this podcast like we have it figured out we are right. we are also talking this through every single day and and that's the beautiful thing you get to have these conversations like talk to your friends open up the conversation start voice noting each other whatever it is like find that's what rose of god is all about like find friends there there's so many beautiful spiritual sisters who would love to have these conversations with you but really what matters at the end of the day is like are you happy you know, because all of this information, where is it going to take us if like we can't experience the point of life, which is to live a life in joy and in alignment with our dharma? You know, it's keeping us from that. Yeah. And to me, that's what I realized. I'm like, I don't want to do anything that's keeping me from living the life that I incarnated yeah. to live on this planet. Yeah. So have the awareness, know what's happening if it's serving you, if you're able to bring light into it, but come back to your natural essence. Mm -hmm. And if you're so tied into this circular like spiral of social media you won't even know your natural like I've even noticed like I follow great people on Instagram or TikTok or whatever TikTok is a little bit harder because you don't get to choose what shows up so sometimes some curveballs will come but I'll still even notice the days that I'm not on it like the weekends I just delete it from my phone Instagram that I'm just a happier person naturally even if I'm following spiritual accounts because there's something in that being on your phone and scrolling, scrolling, scrolling and being stimulated by one message after the next in such a short period of time that really does something to your brain chemistry that it's very, I've ne never have I ever gone off Instagram just like smiling. Oh my God. I you was know? literally just going to say the same thing. I've never Unless have like I ever. Unless like Jared Leto. <laughs> just right. kidding. Yeah. Never have I ever gotten off social media and felt great. Never. Ever. I feel numb. You tap out. You and tap I think out. sometimes I don't you even can, like I see friends and like I don't even like like stuff now. Yeah. I just go through. No one no one even likes because you don't even want to stop to like, you know, it's like not let alone a comment. And it's like I notice that sometimes when I'm scrolling too, it's like you want to stop, but you can't stop. And you're like, okay, this is the last video I'm going to watch or the last post I'm going to read. But something in you makes you want to keep going. And that's how it's designed to be. It's designed to make you spend as much time as possible. So, you know, I think the biggest contributor to our mental health crisis right now is this. You know, it is social media is great in so many ways and we can use it consciously to, you know, to spread our message. I'm sure so many of you have found this podcast through social media and at times like this that are extremely overwhelming, don't feel bad to take time off. Yeah, 100%. It's I, yeah. so important. I actually made a unicorn head, uh, like little, what are they called? Head pieces. And it felt so good to use my hands, first of all, because I saw this really interesting, funny, but not funny meme. And it was like doing my meditation, you're on your phone, eating on your phone, working on your phone, socializing on your phone. Everything that we're doing right now is in the same position on your phone. Like I know I fucking sit on the same chair. I live my life on that chair, work, eat this, that. I'm like, dude, me and this chair are married at this point, you know? So just to do something, sit in another area of your house and like use your hands, like knit, do something that doesn't have a productive purpose besides just making you feel happy and making you remember that you're a human. I think we need to just like human sometimes, yeah. like sit in the sun, like walk around, like roll on the ground, like kids, like they're humaning all the time. It's so natural for them, but we forget, we become so focused on like, okay, what's the productive thing for me to do yeah. next that we don't realize physically we're in the exact same posture day in and day out. Yeah. And just a little reminder to you, the only time I was able to astral project was when I was like staring out the window, mm -hmm. just bored. Yeah. So if you want to cultivate your psychic abilities. Can you tell them about your astral projection story? Oh my God. <laughs> no. Um, no. Yeah, it's fine. I, 
A little snippet. Yeah, a little snippet. Oh my God, that's so funny. It's in the yoga journal, right? Yeah, it was in it, the yoga journal article. So we went to our little, me, Sahara, Tara, and Allison went to a punch of karma in the Blue Ridge Mountains in West North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. I'm like, West at the Art Virginia? of Living Center. Yeah. Uh, at the Art of Living Center, and we, Allison and I were the only ones that were doing the whole, like, we were doing the exact recipe for the Panchakarma, and Sahara and Tara were kind of doing a Panchakarma light. <laughs> and um, one of the days during the, what is it, the, no, it's the, what is it called? It's oh that God, last day when you're in silence. Yeah, so we ha- there's one day that is the purge, the big purge day, and We're supposed to observe silence and we can't meditate, can't pray, can't journal, can't read, can't listen to music, can't basically do anything but stare out the window. And let me tell you, I mean, the the view outside the window, the cascading trees, the Blue Ridge Mountains, like it is a beautiful view. It's a beautiful landscape. There's birds. I mean, like it is gorgeous. So not a bad place to be looking out the window, but it was basically 9 a.m. and I, 10 minutes into just staring out the window, I was like, I am, I can't do this. And you can't fall asleep. You can't go to sleep either. So basically you had to just be bored, really, like being bored. And I couldn't, I went through the whole spectrum of, of emotions. I, I don't actually know if I talked to you about this, but I went from being really into it, like you'd see a bird and you'd get excited because it's like, oh, there's a bird. Like, oh, there's a bird. Oh my God, there's a butterfly. There's a butterfly right outside. Oh my God. You know, like you, it just like any stimulation other than just trees moving in the wind was very exciting. And I, yeah, like 30 minutes in, I was like, I can't do this. And then you start to think about your life and then I'm reflecting and then I'm having memories that I hadn't had in so long. And then I'm like, angry at my parents. And then I'm like, oh, like my childhood sucked, you know, like then you start to go in through that, that whole thing. And then, then this beautiful thing happened. And I akin it to running the marathon. I've ran four marathons and I akined it to that experience, like that physiological experience where there's a moment where you stop feeling pain in your body and you're just, you're just going through the motions so I'm I'm sitting there staring out the window, like just sitting there. And I just started to feel like, yeah, like just like a deep connection to everything. And it was a very euphoric experience. And at that point, I, I looked at the time and, and oddly enough, the time had gone by really quickly, just staring out the window. And Maida came in, our little like caretaker, and said, okay, now it's it's done. Like you can take a nap now and we'll bring you your, your first meal, you know, like in two hours or something. So I was going to meditate. So I'm like, I'm just going to sit. Cause I felt really like spiritual in that moment. I'm like, I'm just totally connected right now. You're to like, everything. I'm not going to stop. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going <laughs> to stop. I'm hours, just going to really just go, you know, extra. And so I, I sat and I tried to meditate, but then the minute I closed my eyes, I'm like, oh no, I need to lay down. And so I laid down and as I laid down, I was fully awake. I would almost say I was in that, like that space between sleep and awake. You know, it's the space I often describe in practicing yoga nidra. You're just, and and yoga nidra, if, if you don't know what yoga nidra is, nidra means sleep and yoga nidra is a sleep-based meditation practice. And it is a deeper meaning than that. So those of you, if you're like yoga nidra nerds, I'm sorry that I'm like bastardizing the definition, but for most people to understand it, that's what yoga nidra is. It rides on the biology of your body and it puts you in a deep state of relaxed present awareness. You're in the theta brainwave state. And I think I was in that state and I decided, I felt myself floating and I could see my body and I just was kind of going with it. It felt very dreamlike and I just wanted to go visit my friends. So I went into Allie's room and I saw her laying down in a very specific way. I saw exactly what she wasn't wearing, (laughs) et cetera. And then I went to go visit Tara and she was journaling. And then I went to go visit Sahara and, and I saw her on this little elliptical machine with her little cap on exactly like 
you know, I described, I was in my mind, like in my mind's eye, right? I was seeing her. She's on the phone. It was right before her wedding. She was going to check out a wedding venue and she's speaking Spanish on the phone. And, you know, then I just, I hear her say like, hasta luego. And then hangs up and, you know, I came back in my body and and that was it. And for some reason, for some crazy reason, we didn't see each other that night. I think it was the following day. The next morning I saw the girls and I felt called, compelled to ask them what they were doing at that time. And before I, before they answered, I described to them like what I, I, I thought I was dreaming I was astral projecting, whatever was happening. I I told them what I was seeing. And funny enough, they were doing something very similar. And when I told you specifically, you were totally baffled because you were like, that's exactly what I was doing. And that's exactly what you said on the phone. And she was It's speaking. interesting because I was on the elliptical earlier that day. And then I had a Zoom call with this photographer in Mexico. And at the end of the conversation, something came over to me to be like, hasta luego in like the most like American, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, like an expat who lives in Mexico who's like, hasta luego, <laughs> you know, so like cute. something <laughs> compelled me to like say it like that. So you literally saw the two things, two things things that I did that day in like one vision that yeah. you would have, you would have never known. And it almost felt like this, the word came through me. Yeah. Know? So, so strange. And it, yeah, it was very, uh, very interesting, but anyway, be bored, watch, just stare out the window, let yourself be. If you want to see what your ex is doing, just get bored. <laughs> know, just be able to see no, right but like, just, no. just to go back because that, it really struck me, you know, that, mm-hmm. that experience really, Powerful. Yeah, I think it was just like the purging, the cleansing. It was the feeling really clear. I was very sattvic. You know, so I sattvic. Felt, I felt no rajas. <laughs> right, at all. And I think there was something really, like I said, yeah, the only way to describe it was that it was very euphoric. And in fact, I tried to recreate it a couple of times even after that, that feeling of just, there was this, when you're connected and you're in that state of connection, the way I describe it is feeling like, that warm blanket as you're staring into a fire or something, you know, you're just, it just, you're cozy, you're warm, you're connected, you're mm-hmm. connected to the elements, you're connected to everything and everyone. The elements I think are major assisters in doing that. Like I yeah. find it very difficult for me to just like sit in my room and just do nothing. Like it's very, very hard unless you're meditating. It's very hard to sit and just stare out the window in your own house. However, I find that when I'm in water, like the ocean, a pool, etc., you are doing nothing. Like when you're yeah. swimming, you're not really doing anything. You're just kind of floating around. So it gives your mind that opportunity to get into that like that flowing, like thoughts are kind of coming in and out. You're sort of meditating, sort of not. You're just Mm -hmm. in that void naturally because you're surrounded by the water. If you're staring at the ocean, if you're like in nature on a hike. So these elements are assisting us to get to our baseline of purity. You know, that's Mm -hmm. what we are. And when we said the word sattvic, that's what it means. It's like the ultimate, just like cleanliness, like purity. And that's what we truly are. That's our true essence. However, our world is very rajasic, which is very aggressive, fire, pitta, like that type of, you know, social media is extremely rajasic. The world is rajasic. And then tamasic, the quality of tamas is very dull and heavy, like inertia. Yeah. Inertia, just feeling like, you know, like you stayed in for a really, really long time, which a lot of people experienced this year too, with staying at home, it brought up a lot of tamas for people. So coming back to that sattva is coming back to the elements, coming back to nature, coming, you know, technology is, you know, again, it, it does have, I think, light codes in it. It is, you know, ideas swirling. There is a feminine consciousness to technology. And I think that we can really side with it and it can, it can assist us in some ways. However, most of us are letting ourselves be used by it. We're not using technology. We're letting ourselves be used by it. So yeah, take unplug, the power back. Take the power back. Snap it back. Yeah, snap it back. Take the power back. You, and you, and look what awaits, you know, like you being able to see what we're all doing in another room from just one day of sitting alone, that automatically happened. Yeah. Imagine what weeks, yeah. months, years I mean, of I've, that I've never... Do. It's like I've never regretted taking technology breaks. It's like I I think right. about I think about it like with drinking. Like with drinking, I never regretted not drinking. I 
always regretted drinking Mm -hmm. you know like the next morning to me my practice is the most sacred thing and in the morning my morning time that's like my miracle manifesting connection time the morning time is like the most sacred time of the day for me and and I'm so it's so much a part of my daily ritual that I need to have that experience for me to feel connected to the world and I don't like to do anything that's going to fuck with that you know like I I go to bed at a certain time I you know don't eat past a certain time you live your life to have that time to have that time and so with drinking like it was affecting that you know and and I didn't like that like I would wake up and I'd regret it every single time I never woke up after drinking and and say oh I'm so glad I drank last night I had the best time it was always like no like I feel like shit I don't ever want to drink ever again cut to the next day and you're drinking, right? But I'm going to compare it to technology. Like I've never taken a social media break and regretted it. Like I've never been off social media for a week and, and been like, oh, And I'm here's so the thing. Sad. It's so easy to catch up. You know, I think that's our fear. Like I'm going to be out of the loop. I'm going to not know what's happening in the world or, you know, what we can or can't say this, this week, you know? Yeah, and it's yeah. like, don't worry, you do a couple of scrolls, you'll, you'll catch up real yeah, fast. Yeah, you're fine. You yeah. know, there was this, right before I decided to write the book, actually, one of my ideas was to be off social media for a year. Mm. Like, I, I've been wanting to do that for so long, you know, which can still potentially happen maybe soon. If somebody's listening to this and you're called to do it, like, try it and, and let us know how I it mean, goes. if my, like, you know, our businesses are tied to social media. So that's the difficult thing too. It's like, you know, and a lot of people listening, their businesses are from social media. But if you're someone who doesn't need to be on there, you get to take that break if you want. Yeah, do that break. Do that break. (laughs) Let us us. know how it is. (laughs) So yeah, I think we all get to assess our relationships, snap the cat back sometimes and come back in and be like, okay, here, here's how I want to be. I, I put like a timer on mine so I can only be on for one hour. But then I keep saying, remind me in 15 minutes, remind me in 15 oh. minutes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to be better at it. But you know, it, and it all, it all interconnects into the only reason why we would suggest that is so you can tune into your own truth. Some people yeah. don't need it. Some people I know, they're like, I forget to post for days. I forget to even go on social media. I'm like, wow, amazing. You know, and it could be, it could be something else. It could be watching too many TV shows. Yeah, it could watching, be oh, whatever night, else. Yeah for, yeah, for us, like it's definitely that, you know, I, I definitely try to limit myself on social media. I don't actually think that I have a, a, a problem there. I think for me now, since COVID has been the Netflix binging, you know, because we didn't, I was for the longest time, we didn't have a TV in the bedroom. Now you got one. Now. They say that's the number one relationship killer. Oh my goodness. I'm not, and Tori and I. Sex life killer. Right? I'm just like, oh, it is the worst. Like I... I get addicted, so then I'm like, I go from. I feel like it's it a '90s not. baby thing, like falling asleep with the TV on. Yeah, totally, <laughs> yeah. totally. It's like, oh, I can't. I'm not relaxed unless the TV's. The TV's on. Like yeah. just falling asleep, waking up to commercials at 2 a.m. Something yeah. so soothing about it. <laughs> no, it's so prana depleting. You it's know? 10 a. 10 p.m. Do you know where your kids you are? Know? Oh my god. <laughs> It's super prana depleting. See, my issue is I can never find a show that I like. So I don't really get hooked onto shows because I just don't resonate with any of them. Oh, you're so lucky. Tori literally is like, and that's part of what he's doing right now, you know? So it's like screening. It's like research, you know? Right. So he gets, and some of these storylines are really, I love, I love, I mean, look, I grew up in LA. Like I know a lot of people in the entertainment industry. I know a lot of screenwriters. I know a lot of filmmakers. So, and I love film. Like I, I really love film. I love story. I love storytellers and, and I love to read novels, you know, like, so for me, the medium of art via film is, is very, I love it. You know, mm-hmm. it's very, um, it's also nostalgic for me because I grew up going to the movie theater with my family. It was the only family time we had going to the movies and going to the beach. That was it. So I enjoy it. I just don't need to like now with the way Netflix is with a show, it's not, it's like in four seconds, they oh, put yeah, on the next, like next episode. Next, yeah. next. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. Like that was the only in the beginning of COVID. Like we were just, I mean, I'd stay up to like one, two o'clock in the morning and you know, that's not my norm. Cause you're like, waking up at like 4am. Oh yeah. yeah. I'm like 9pm is like, I'm in deep REM. 
at 9 p.m. I'm already like in a deep sleep. I'm you like know? eating dinner. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> but I just I've always been a late sleeper. No, I that's know it's good. not very Ayurvedic. You know, I have a, you do what you, you do. You know, we've talked about the chronotypes, right? Have you, Ex- we've talked yes, about the Yes, like chronotypes. I am the, I think it's called the bear. The bear. You're the mm-hmm. bear. Yeah. And I actually have a, a quiz that I'm doing so that you can find out what your chronotype is and what yoga nidra is best for you to Ooh, do. Wait, can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah. So there are four different types of chronotypes. And I'll actually put the link so people want to read more. Yeah, we'll have that link in the show notes. Yeah, so you can read about what the chronotypes are. And like I was talking about earlier about yoga nidra, I mean, for me right now, the the most important thing that like my students are struggling with is sleep. And yoga nidra is something that everybody can do. Not everybody can do asana movements. Not everybody can feels comfortable doing yoga or starting yoga, especially now not having somebody, a teacher doing it online. And some people might be more inspired to do yoga, doing it online. So yoga nidra is basically you're laying on your back or you're laying in a comfortable position. And like I said, it is a guided sleep-based meditative practice that actually takes you into a deep state of consciousness. It rides on the biology of your body. So it's like takes you through all of the senses to put you in a deep state of relaxation. And a lot of, there's a lot of studies being done with yoga nidra, with healing PTSD, healing trauma, healing different, well, okay, I don't want to say like, oh, yoga nidra is going to heal you. But so disclaimer, it's a practice that's being used in accordance with whatever therapeutic practices they're doing. And it's because it's very accessible for everybody. And, you know, the body, given the opportunity, will heal itself by itself. Your body, when it's contracted and it's in fear or anxious, is not allowing your body to heal. It's in fight or flight or freeze. So when you're in yoga nidra and you're able to go into a deep state of relaxation, guess what happens? Your body's relaxed, rest and digest. Your body's able to go into that parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest, as opposed to being in the sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight, fight, flight, fight, or freeze. So yes, yoga nidra. There are different types of yoga nidras. The, the yoga nidra school that I come from with my teacher, Yoga Rupa Rod Stryker, is tantra, so it's tantric lineage. And there are different types of yoga nidra. People can find tons of yoga nidra. There's great yoga nidra. That's my Tibet, Tibetan bell or glass bowl mm-hmm. for grounding. <laughs> There's a lot of great yoga nidra teachers out there. Insight Timer has some good yoga nidra practices. You can find, I've got a couple on YouTube as well. But there are a couple of practices that I recorded for the four different types of chronotypes. Mm. So maybe one yoga nidra is more focused on relaxing certain areas or certain energies of the body more than others because you might need a different type of focus for your chronotype since you're having dinner at 9 p.m. So what what are the four chronotypes? All right. So we've got the bear chronotype, which is the one that you said you are. Most people under the bear chronotype, it means their sleep and wake cycle goes according to the sun. So the bear wakes up easily and typically falls asleep with no problem. Productivity seems best before noon and they're prone to that dip between two and six. Okay. And what time do they sleep? Typically around like 11 or 12. Okay. I'm like a late bear. Okay. I sleep at like, yeah, I sleep at 11 or 12, I would say. Okay. So then we have the wolf chronotype and the wolf has a trouble, trouble waking up in the morning. I don't have trouble waking up. And typically their peak productivity starts like around noon. Yeah, that's true for me. And then you get another boost around like six o'clock. I guess it just depends on what I'm doing. Oh I'm like a wolf bear. <laughs> okay. The next one's the lion. So unlike wolves, lions are, they're early birds like me. Okay. So I'm a lion. They wake up before the dawn. They do their best work before noon. You know, I get, I get a little bit of a dip during the, I don't know, maybe around like 11 or 12 o'clock. Like I start to feel myself like my best productivity happens in the morning. 
Mm-hmm. All my emails, all my stuff. So you just happens. wake up and you're like, oh, you do your practice. Yeah, and I do my ready practice, and then like eight o'clock, I'm like getting work done. I'm writing. Oh, I'm doing everything before noon. So by noon, I'm like already my day is like done. Like wow. I might do some an See, interview. See, I start my work day at noon. Okay, like so, noon to like six or seven p.m. Yeah, it's feeling more and more like you're a wolf, not a bear. But I don't have I don't have a trouble waking up. Like I wake up at like nine a.m. Hmm, you're a wolf bear. I'm a wolf bear. Okay. And then typically the lion goes to bed between like nine and 10. Then there's the dolphin. The dolphin, I feel like you're a dolphin because the dolphin does it. A dolphin has a hard time following any schedule. Okay. Like they, they often don't get enough sleep because they're sensitive to noise and light. Their peak productivity is from like 10 to two. But yeah, they kind of they kind of have a hard time with having like a legitimate sleep schedule. No, I sleep pretty easily. I don't wake up. Well, but I love dolphins. I'd love to be one. I know. <laughs> well, there's more information. Look, if you guys want to learn more about the chronotypes, there is, I think his name is Dr. Cohen. Yeah, like sleep doctor. Yeah, he's he's really he's the one that like coined the chronotypes. Mm-hmm. You know, like he did a lot of research about them, so we we can probably link his. Mm-hmm. You can do a chronotype quiz on his as well. But the one that I created was just sort of like a just blanketed questions to just understand what your sleep cycles are because the practices were created for each specific chronotype. Mm-hmm. So like the bear Yoga Nidra will be more focused on like Senkalpa, mm. you know, so it'll be like a Senkalpa based Yoga Nidra. The chronotype, the lion chronotype will be Yoga Nidra for cognition. Mm. So it'll be a little bit more focused on that. The dolphin will be Yoga Nidra for spiritual awakening. And the Yoga Nidra for the wolf will be Yoga Nidra for transformation. Mm. So. Yeah, I, I actually went to a talk with the sleep doctor and he was talking at them and he was saying how a lot of artists are the wolf because at nighttime, and it makes sense because 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. in Ayurveda is Vata time. Yeah. It's a time that's extremely, you know, actually, sorry, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. is Pitta time. 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. is Vata time. So that second wind that we get is like 10 p.m. So, you know, traditionally in Ayurveda, before we had electricity, you couldn't stay up you all night. Stay so up all night, that yeah. would be your time for like peak sleep, you know, between 10 p.m. And, and 2 a.m. So that's when you're getting your like highest REMS because you're waking up super early. Whereas, you know, for me, especially if I'm writing a book, that's like my best writing time oh, because so I'm like so full of energy because I'm not getting texts, I'm not getting emails. The world is energetically quiet and I can just be so like, that's my most, like I'm so on. Yeah. And then at 2 a.m. it turns more into like philosophical. Oh, like, you wow, know, that's great. Like, yeah. like Steven, that's when he's making all his music yeah. and like channeling and that actually, you know, in Kundalini yoga and in Buddhism, that's when they're doing their, their Kriyas at 4 a.m. or mm-hmm. they're doing their most spiritual things at 4 a.m., which is peak Vata time. Yeah. So I find it interesting because yeah, in traditional Ayurveda, for sure, you're supposed to wake up very early, sleep early, et cetera. But it was a very different time. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have yeah. all of these things. And I do think biologically, yeah, we are different. I, even when I was in elementary school, would sleep at 11 p.m. I would pull all-nighters when I was in middle school. Like, that's just who I am. Oh so God. instead, if if I didn't have those, I actually wouldn't have been able to write my books because that's when I am creative. I'm just like, during the day, I'm just kind of like doing the things I need to to do. Yeah. So yeah. write it. If that's your best work, if it helps you bring you towards your dharma, then do it. Yeah. And I think it's it's great to be able to just utilize the time that you have and like, you know, get more in sync with that and to know that about yourself. You know, yeah, that's why I wanted to create specific yoga nidras for each, you know, and look, you can do all four. Like you can absolutely do all four practices. And I would recommend to do all four practices to just have the experience. But yeah, like I think it's important for people to know what works best for them. You know, I'm a morning person. My little sister is like you. She is a night owl. She she likes to be up at night. She does all of her schoolwork. Everything happens at night and she doesn't wake up till like noon, you know. I don't ever actually remember being that person. I've always been a morning person. I love the morning time. You know, I just always have... 
I want to be able to just get those morning rays or to see the light hit the trees, you know, as it's coming up. Like it just, it, like I said, is just a magical time. And I just love to, to see yeah. it. The minute the sun goes down, that alerts my body that I'm ready for bed. Yeah. And that's very connected to the circadian rhythm yeah. cycles. I mean, that's why I actually like going to Bali because it's the only time I get to see the sunrise because <laughs> I'm jet <laughs> lagged, you jet-lagged. know, or like I used to love like being jet lagged because I'm like, oh, great. This will make me hopefully sleep oh. earlier, but then quickly my body goes back to whatever cycle it's in. Yeah. So you know it's innate because I don't need to wake up at a certain time. Yeah. My body is choosing to yeah. be like this. Yeah, and you have to listen to that. Like you truly do. And that's why I like the work that he did because it's it's so interesting to know, yeah, like that there are different chronotypes. Mm-hmm. Like I wonder how dating your chrono, if you have a different chronotype as a person you're dating, like I wonder well, what that's Steven like. Well, Steven is definitely more wolf than I am. Like he sleeps much late. He sleeps at 6 a.m. You know, he's like a full on all nighter. So it's interesting because we're both also projectors in human design that do best if they're sleeping alone. So I kind of get to have that alone sleeping experience because I'll sleep, let's say it's at midnight, maybe 1 a.m. And I'm fast asleep by the time he comes to bed. I don't even notice. So then he gets his hours in bed. So it actually kind of works well. But like, yeah, yeah, let's say if I was with some early bird, they would hate me, you know? We went on vacation. They're like, we want to do the sunrise hike. I'd be like, okay, I'll stay up all night to make make it there. Well, it's funny because Tori was not a morning person like he used to he used to do the all night he used to work all night and in the beginning it was you know it was fine because you're dating somebody you're kind of just like I love you for how you are and then like you're like look bitch if you want this to work. right <laughs> I was like listen you better get your shit together and wake up early but like actually notice because my mom would say the same thing she's an early bird like you and I think our society sees like if you wake up early like it's very puritan right like the early bird catches us where like early yeah, is yeah. the right way to be early is the right way to be but it's like a lot of the best artists of our time we're night owls. Yeah. And like our school, like that's what I remember our school in high school, it started at 7 30 in the fucking morning. Like the first three hours, I don't even think I knew what was going on. Wow. Because my mind couldn't even well, yeah, be that's registered. why it's so important to understand the chronotypes for kids too, because not all the children are gonna be learning it up at seven o'clock in Especially, the morning. Especially I think high school kids too, they yeah. naturally sleep later and wake up later. So yeah. I don't know why scientifically, but but I think that if they paid more attention to their that rhythm, that they would probably get a lot more productivity from. Yeah, I mean, the kids. even like daylight savings time, you know, like it's really tough because a lot of when daylight savings happens, a majority of people who are working nine to five jobs don't get to see the sun, you know, because it's like yeah. by the time you get back from work, it's five six p.m. Like here, the sun, you know, when it's when it's winter, it's setting at four thirty p.m. You know, so it's like really throwing us off biologically. But the good thing about quarantine that I was actually thinking about was like, we get to spend that time at home. So you do get to, even if before you had an hour long commute and you didn't get to see the sun or you didn't get to go outside, we all have that opportunity right now. So just, even though it's really tough and it's really chaotic, we should all remember the times that we were wishing we got to spend more time at home and, you know, choosing, like, I think a lot of people, especially in corporate, I worked at an ad agency for a very short amount of time when I was in college and I hated it, but I cannot picture you working at a corporate job. It was, it was not a good (laughs) site, but I remember, you know, the conversations were like, oh my God, imagine if we could work at home. Like that was like, that was like the goal. Like you've made it if you can work at home. And now, you know, a lot of us, not all of us, there are still frontline workers. There are still people that need to report to offices, but a lot of us do have the opportunity now to work at home. So those practices that we didn't have enough time for, we get to implement them in. Yeah. Well, and part of what I was saying last year, like, I'm sure you remember this, but all I wanted to was just be at home. I'm like, mm-hmm. all I want to do is just yeah, be at home. Yeah, you're traveling so much. Oh my goodness. I was like, all I want to do is just be at home. That's all I want. And that's literally all I've done yeah. this year. I remember with Stephen and I, our biggest like issue in our marriage was that he would always have to go travel because of these shows. Like there was always festivals in different places. And I'm like, you're always gone. You're always traveling. Or he'd have to be like, go to client dinners and then the studio at night and this and that. That I was like, I don't get to see you that much. And Trust me, not seeing him enough is not a problem anymore. <laughs> I'm like, when is that festival starting again? Yeah. <laughs> I know I'm like leaving tomorrow morning. I'm going to Portland, you know? Yeah. 
So, you know, there is also such beauty in these times yeah. that we do get to ground and have these practices and so many great things. So thank you for this beautiful conversation. I just love having my besties on. So we just get to talk and dive in and people can just like hear just a normal ass conversation. Yeah, you know? I think it's, it's Two good. non-experts figuring out life. Right. <laughs> Listening. Back at you in the studio. Right. <laughs> so where can listeners connect with you, download your beautiful, you have a chakra guide as well as learn more about these yoga nidra archetypes. Yeah, they can just uh, go to radicallyloved.com or they can follow me on Instagram at rosiacosta. Yes. Well, thank you so much for being (gasps) here. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're the best. And I'm so grateful. You've built such a beautiful community. And I'm just, I'm so honored to be here and to be with all of you guys listening. Thanks. Thank you, Sister Queen. Namaste. Mm, What a deep dive. We really went there, right? (laughs) And sometimes that's what you need to just have these super deep conversations with your friends that just kind of like go into all of the little, you know, corners of your mind of things you've been kind of thinking about on your own and just have someone to reflect that back to. So I hope what this episode gave you is to feel like you were that third friend sitting with, with us on the couch talking about these things. And I hope it instigates your own insights and viewpoints and awarenesses, which you totally do not have to share with us. And I invite you to begin these dialogues with your friends and the people that you trust and how important important is to have, you know, confidence that we can explore these things with and not feel like you're a burden or you're crazy or no one wants to hear what's on your mind, but it's actually a beautiful thing and something that we all really deeply deserve and need to be able to share so openly and fluidly with your friends. So If you're looking for more friends, spiritual friends who want to talk about these things, who want to have these deep conversations and kind of question the meaning of life and social media and and all of it, then I invite you to join us in Rose Gold Goddesses. This is my Sacred Sisterhood Collective, all about embodying the goddess within. We have monthly goddess circles. We actually have one coming up this Sunday featured on a new goddess every single month. So we tune into that goddess archetype. So for example, last month we were working with Ichel, which is all about the womb and connecting to your divine feminine energy. And we've worked with Lakshmi all about abundance and Saraswati all about creativity and Kuan Yin on compassion and Bridget all about new beginnings and Kalima all about, you know, releasing your former self and so many more. So when you join, you have access to all of the goddess circles that we've done. It includes my top workshops, masterclasses, e-courses from healing and embodiment through dance, awaken your powers with Shaman Durek, sex, money, magic with Alexandra Roxo. We have monthly expert calls, guests from the High Self podcast, hopping on a Zoom call with you guys, answering your questions, doing rituals, doing practices with you. We do monthly member-led workshops. So you're able to share your gifts with the community, whether it is breath work or storytelling or Anything it is, we welcome it all in Rose Gold Goddesses. So you can find the link in the show notes. It is rosegoldgoddesses, plural, dot com. That's rosegoldgoddesses.com. And we're super excited to invite you inside. If you loved this episode, I would love to send you a free gift, which is the first half of my unreleased book, Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type. This is a different book than Eat Feel Fresh, my first book ever, which is not released anywhere. And I am gifting it exclusively to those who leave a review of my podcast in the iTunes store. So all you got to do is head over to iTunes where you may be listening to this podcast and leave a review. Take a screenshot that you've left it and email it over to me at sahara at eatfeelfresh.com. Again, that's sahara, S-A-H-A-R-A, at eat feelfresh.com. And I will send you back the first half of my unreleased book, Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type, which goes all into Ayurveda, doshas, plant-based nutrition, body types, all of the things in a really fun and engaging way. So this is my gift to you for free for supporting the podcast. Every single review I personally read, it really helps the podcast be listened to by more people so we can raise the vibration of the planet together. And I am so grateful to have you on this journey. Thank you so much for listening and I'll see you on the next episode. Namaste. 